they they never they'll never give me credit for what I've actually done, unless I just come out here and win the championship in Portland, mm-hmm. and they better hope that don't happen. <laughs> well, like they better see, pray that I don't win the championship for the Blazers. And it, I get that's and that's very true. And they better off, pray because the same way you like they don't know that side. They going <laughs> they better pray I don't win the damn championship. <laughs> Our guest today just brought home an all-star three-point contest trophy while wearing his Weaver State jersey that's retired. He's a seven-time all-star, the face of the Portland Trail Blazers, and a good friend, Damian Lillard. Welcome to Point Forward Podcast. We have a very special guest, one of my favorite teammates, a very, very good friend of mine, and one of the best scorers in the league, if not the best scorer in the league, the Honorable Damian Lillard. What's good? What's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? So, um... You start every conversation basically with how'd you get here? I think it goes back to what was it, 2016? Yeah, 2016. 2016. We doing uh <laughs> free agency pitches <laughs> and uh you know we meet with a few few people, they like, man, well what what about Evan Turner? <laughs> and I'm like, I like E. T. Like he I think he could help us because at the time I'm thinking we need another playmaker, another ball yeah. handler, some experience. So uh, they like, well, we're going to have to get on the phone with him. And I called you like, what's up? Like, <laughs> we need you. I love your game. And you like, what, me? Like, he, yeah, like bro, it was funny how you was just, <laughs> you was taken back. You know what I'm saying? And I had just heard your voice. Like, I saw some interviews. I'm like, man, I don't know. He might be a little weird. <laughs> he might be a little weird. So, I mean, obviously – you end up coming, a, a deal you couldn't turn down. Of course not. I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. A deal you couldn't turn down, and then, you know, the rest was, was history. I think uh, you know me at this point. Once I get around people, I don't I don't go for no funny behavior. You know, I feel like I read people pretty well. And from that point on, you know, we just hit it off. You know, I, I do well with authenticity and just solid behavior. And, uh, you know, you showed me that over a long period of time. So, um, it left from just being teammates to, you know, us having a real friendship. And, um, you know, I don't really do too much, you know, just interviews everywhere all over the place uh, where it's something that I choose to do. So, um, obviously, with the relationship we built, I was, you know, when she was like, let's do it, I was like, let's do it. It's nothing. <laughs> no, nah, nah, I appreciate it for real. It's Thank nothing. you. So, uh, obviously, you're back in Utah. A spot that's uh, very important to you. Your yeah. first album was called The Letter O after the city of Ogden, Utah. Yeah. Can you take us back to what it means to be in an all-star game in front of all these people and familiar faces where you're definitely one of the biggest yeah. biggest names here. I mean, I think it's when you're younger, you just you want to be in an all-star game. You want to make it so yeah. bad. You know, I think we all take it personal, yeah. like being here or not being here when we're younger. Um, and I think that's from more of an accolade type of uh, standpoint like you want to be an all-star you want to be mentioned with the best and I think now I just have a different level of appreciation for um, you know being here for a seventh time being amongst the best players you know as the game has changed you know over the last decade uh, it's always an honor you know to be a part of this and to to be in my seventh one in Utah where I went to school Um, you know I became an adult here you know it's a lot of friends and family to me now that that live here that um, were in my corner before I became who I am now. So uh, just to be able to come back here and have this experience and know that I'm going to see a lot of familiar faces, um, you know, it's pretty special uh, being the fact that it's not in Oakland where I actually grew up, being able to have another place where, um, you know, you create that type of energy is is rare. So um, I don't take it for granted. And, I'm you know, I'm appreciating the fact that I can have this type of experience. you know, with a place outside of my hometown. Yeah. So we know you from Oakland everything. Let's talk about when, what made you decide to go to Weber State? Clearly we always talk about you being, you know, the, the low major guy that really put things on. And, uh, yeah. you know, you came out of high school as a two-star recruit. Yeah. And even, you know, talk about a decision and, you know, the excitement that it was. Or The, the funny thing is I – only knew what Weber State was because I used to play March Madness with Raymond Felton on the cover. And I used to want to lead a small school to the national championship. So I would create a player and I would go to like one of the lowest 
ranked lowest major schools on the game. And after, like, messing around with it for a while, like, I would notice some of the small schools had, like, a small gym. Yeah. Like, it was real small <laughs> even on the game. But Weber State actually had, like, a real stadium. Like, they had a real stadium even on the game. And um, I started creating a player and sending them to Weber State. So I would literally win the national championship with Weber State, and I had no idea what Weber State was. So fast forward to um, the summer I was in an AAU tournament in Texas, and uh, we had a 9 a.m. game, you know, and none of us on, on our team was getting recruited at this time. It was like we were going into our our uh, our senior year. So it was after our junior year going into our senior year. And 9 a.m. game, we warming up, and, uh, like, one coach walked up, and he was sitting underneath the basket. And my AAU coach walked over and was like, hey, you see him right there? That's – that's Randy Ray, we uh, head coach at Weber State. <laughs> so in my eyes, I was like, I got to have a big game because I just need one scholarship, and that's yeah. the school I'm going to. Like right. Whoever offered me first, I'm going. Like, you know how it is when yeah, you're of not course. being recruited. Yeah, you'll of take course. anything. Yeah, I, I was excited I about Southern Illinois. <laughs> I was excited about junior college coaches wanting my number. Like, yeah. So Coach Ray come to the game, have a big game. They offered me a scholarship. And uh, – I was excited. I was ready to commit right there. But my coach like, nah, you got to – it's going to pick up. You got to take yeah. your time. You're going to have to take some visits. You got to get to know them or whatever. So over time, I got to meet a lot of coaches. And the staff at Weber State, I got to know them really well. And they was probably the only staff that didn't just – Bow down, you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like they stood on principle. And you Phil, know? Phil Beckner was there. Phil was there. Uh, he definitely my trainer he's now. Down. Yeah. But Phil, the thing is, Phil was just the GA. Okay. He wasn't even an assistant coach at the time because he uh -huh. was young. And uh, I remember when I actually came here on my visit, the team is playing pickup, and after they got done, I was shooting around, and all the coaches, you know, when they recruiting a the player, they almost gassing you up. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, everybody's yeah. kind of like wanting you to feel good. And I just remember looking into the tunnel and Phil just in the tunnel, just like, just staring at me. He got like this look on his face. And I remember feeling like he don't think I'm that good. <laughs> like <laughs> he the one dude in here that's not like trying to like sell me something. Yeah. So it's funny that we had a relationship that we have today because he, I literally remember seeing him in the tunnel just looking like, you know, they kissing this kid ass. He ain't even that good. Like yeah. I can see it on his face. But after my visit, I still didn't commit because I had other ones set up. Yeah. And then they ended up coming to Oakland. And when they came to Oakland and they met my family, and I was like, at that time, I, at that point, I had built a real relationship sure. with them to the point where the other coaches would call and I would just be like, listening to what they had to say. I would answer a few questions and I was ready to get off the phone. Yeah. But when Weaver was calling, I was like, I knew everything about them. You know, I knew everything about the program because we had real conversations. And I was actually excited to talk to them. And, um, once it got to that point, you know, some, some bigger schools started to come in, but I was already convinced, like, you know, I think that's the situation for me. Yeah. And um, that was that. You know, I committed to them. I came here, and, you know, the rest is history. So leaving, a lot of people understand, you're leaving uh, Oakland, you know, after being at three different high schools, yeah. two-star recruit, you know, getting recruited later or whatever. What was that mindset going into Weber State because – you know, you think about the blue chip schools and all those big time players, like, were you saying like, I'm here? Like, did you already know you're making to the NBA or was it just like, I'm gonna close my eyes and take a crazy swing? I mean, I always felt in my heart I was gonna make it to the NBA. And when I came to Weber, I was like, I'm a, you know, I'm about to turn it up, you know, I'm a, I'm gonna make it. Hmm. And I remember like, I came here in the summer, like, before the school year started. I came in the summer after I graduated high school, and we did, like, conditioning. We played pickup, and I was, like, dead tired after conditioning. <laughs> we played pickup. I couldn't score. And I remember thinking to myself, like, if I can't do nothing against these dudes, how, like, I'm not going to no league. Like, yeah. this is crazy. Um, but it was just, like, that the belief that I had in myself wouldn't even let me believe those thoughts. So I just kept going. And – um Eventually, I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to do it. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? I slowly started to get more and more comfortable. And um, I felt like I was going to do it. Like, I really had it in my mind. Like, right. I'm going to make it. And you, you know, that was that. You've always been a hard worker. 
and like you always been OD confident, but where do you think that confidence comes from? I think a lot of people are obsessed and admire the mind of Damian Lillard because yeah. it's, I always tell people it's really how he feels and it's really pure. Yeah. And sometimes I'll hit you, I'll be like, wow, bro, like it's a blessing to to have crazy self-belief but yeah. actually know whatever happens next, I'm going to conquer it. Like I tell him, I always joke around, like, bro, you like a superhero. So, like, <laughs> like where, is that, where does that come from? Like, Honestly, is I think it was something that I've always had because I've always been around it, but then it's just been, like, I've been adding to it. So, like, when I was younger, I really didn't have a choice but to think that. Yeah. Like, the type of people in the family I grew up in, like, everybody thought that about yeah, themselves. Yeah, shout like, out Do- Dozier, you say I'm to, league, right? <laughs> to this day, everybody in my family thinks they're the best athlete in my family, <laughs> and I'm in the family. So, like, but they really believe it, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. So, like, I grew up around that, so it was no, it wasn't an option to have or or to have self-belief um and i think as i got older and i started to you know get in high school and go to college and i started to realize the type of uh environment i came up in and the type of stuff that i was taught and that was was put in me and i started to see that so many people didn't have it yeah and people would talk and say the right things but it was too many things that i would notice that Uh. told me otherwise like that's Today, people would say, like, you're not built like that, you know? Yeah. I would notice stuff like that. Like, that don't, that don't line up with yeah, what you, you're saying. You used like, to say that all the time. If somebody got, into, yeah, somebody got into a scuffle, you pull him to the side, like, bro, they ain't finna fight. Yeah, no. He won't. Or I'm he like, ain't going do nothing. Yeah, but like, he going to fight. you like, no, nah, bro, he's not fighting. <laughs> and it's it's on even more levels than just fighting, too. Just, yeah. like, even in a game, like, in a moment, like, I'm willing to go out there and fail. You know, I'm willing yeah, to go out there absolutely. and look crazy if it come down to it, and I'm not going to think anything more of it other than i look crazy in that moment you know what i'm saying <laughs> it's not going to ch- it's not going to mm-hmm. shake my belief in no way and i think that comes from like i said my upbringing and then just seeing or not seeing what i see in other people based off of what i know and what i've been around and then also there's so many people just pouring into me you know just the the trainers the you know my dad my cousins my uncles my aunties my mom the uh you know the other father figures that I've had in my life the Phil Taylors the Raymond Youngs um Aaron Jake I mean I've had so I've met all the right people yeah that's really like David Vanderpool like the fact that I came into the league as a rookie and the first person that I heard from before training camp was David Vanderpool and it was like I'm gonna be working with you and he just was on my ass like off the rip you know what I'm saying everything I like I just – everything just lined up for me, you know, outside of what I already grew up in. It was like the right – I had the right people. So is that – I want to talk about the Formula Zero camp. So is that what uh, – is that what forced you to get back? It felt like an obligation to get back because a lot of people that you mentioned just a second ago, mm-hmm. those are all the same people that worked the camp. Yeah. I remember being at the camp this summer. Some of the top high school players there, a lot of NBA scouts. But, um, you know, one thing that was really different was – they got to work with you and see your mentality. Yeah. And when you break down the youth, because you and I talk about it all the time, you're like, the game's a little different where, you know, you might have a guy say some off-the-wall stuff like Mikey Williams, like, I'm not going to prom. Like, yeah. bro, go to prom, work hard. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Talk about the camp and, and what you're trying to get out of that. And there's a lot of killers, like yeah. Keontae George, a lot of people that went there that are yeah. doing very, very successful no, I think right that, now. Like we talk about all the time, the game has changed. And, you know, you got – when we came up, it was like, I want to go to North Carolina or Ohio State or yeah. Duke, you know. The Ohio State, yeah. The Ohio <laughs> State. I call it Ohio State. It ain't the Ohio State to me. Uh, nah, I hear you. You got but, hands. <laughs> <laughs> but, nah, like, it's the game has changed. And I feel like it's a lot of things that, that I'm talking about that, you know, just having the right people, having the right message in your ear, you know, having the type of support that they want everything for you but nothing from you, you know. It's like not keeping score. It's a lot mm-hmm. of kids that have people in their corner now for a reason. Like they're expecting a return mm-hmm. on whatever their investment is instead of having people that just want to see – they just wish you well, you know what I'm saying? Like you know how many people I would owe gas money and <laughs> – you know, rides and with old money and all this stuff that just was doing it off the strength. You know, they wanted to see me do well. And now that I'm doing great, 
they don't remind me of it, you know. They yeah. just continue to be who they are to me. And I think these kids now, they don't experience that. So it makes it makes them behave in a way and think in a way that's um, not in their best interest. So, like, with Formula Zero, it wasn't uh, – the camp, obviously, you want to give them exposure to NBA scouts and give them an opportunity to, you know, have their future as they want it, be NBA players, mm-hmm. be professionals. But it was more so – um, wanting to share what I know I have that has given me an advantage and allowed me to be as successful as successful yeah. as I've been. And even at camp, I was telling the kids, like, this is called Formula Zero, and obviously I'm number zero. But I'm not, I'm not the formula. I'm just a product of the formula, yeah. which is why, like you said, all of the people that I named were working at camp because I want them – to breathe the same life and the same message into these kids and help them understand and be able to take it and and move forward with that knowledge. So the camp is more about that than, you know, they got all the talent in the world and all the skills in the world. You know, maybe they can work harder. Maybe they can understand, you know, what they're working on a little bit better. But it's more of a mental, a mentality thing, you know, character, what type of, you know, compassion, how well can you follow directions? Are yeah. you willing to listen? Are you coachable? Uh, are you self? Like, you got to yeah. kind of remove those things from a lot of these kids so that they can really realize the their true potential. Yeah. And that's that's my whole reason for doing Formula Zero. Like, I don't want no credit. I just want to share, you know, what, I, what I've had in my favor with a lot of these kids because I see it's needed. And they say that the game is sold, not told. <laughs> And you know, Formula Zero, they getting it for free. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So that's 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 my only thing with with Formula Zero. Yeah, I want to go back to a younger Dame because I I found it something you know pretty interesting because your upbringing, some of the stories mm-hmm. you told me back in the day, just going to three high schools, yeah. even back in the day, hot temper, you had no problem yeah. fighting and everything like that. What did you learn during those times, or what what moment was there where it's like, all right, I need to you know fix this in order to get better, or like. Am I behaving in this sense? What I read something that most of your friends died in high school and yeah. by not being in the right environment, the right situation. Where did you start seeing where you need to straighten up and kind of be like, yo, I only got a couple years left. Let me get this going and follow my dreams. Because yeah. the formative years in high school are the most important parts. You know what I'm saying? Um, I would say uh, I always was, like, sharp mentally. Yeah. But, I mean, I think just when you grow up around everything where – you seeing people be successful and be around stuff and people, you know, I've just seen so many things that I felt like the stuff I was doing was innocent. You know, <laughs> I get into a, a scuffle at school or, you know, just little petty stuff, you know, but it wasn't petty because it was continuing, you know. So uh, the thing that I think of, number one, is I was uh, my sophomore year in high school. I transferred to a private school. I didn't really like it. You know, I hated private school. And, um, Safe. I wasn't <laughs> I wasn't playing. So yeah. my coach literally I was just would be on the bench the whole game and I'm a sophomore in high school and uh I remember uh I text the coach and I'm like, How come I don't I don't play? Like why you don't play me? Huh. And he told he was like, You have soft you make soft passes, you know, he just kinda said a list of things to me. Um and some of them I couldn't argue with, you know, mm-hmm. like I wasn't talking trash, but, like, I had a way about me that was, like, it might have appeared that in practice I was really against the, my teammate that I was playing against because I was just competitive yeah. like that. Um, you know, so, like, at that time when I wasn't playing, then, like, I was going to school. I didn't like school there. Hoop wasn't working out, so I was ineligible. Like, I actually, like, had, like, a 1.5 or something, and I was ineligible, and I had never done that before because yeah. I always did well in school. And – you know, I became eligible, like, right during the playoffs. I didn't really play. At the end of the season, I've told this story before. I had a conversation with the coach where he basically was telling me, like, I wasn't going to be on the team and broke down all these numbers about, you know, this many kids go to college, this many kids make it, whatever, whatever, and basically told me, like, you really think you're going to be one of those people, you know? And I was like, yeah. And – I left his office, I caught the bus home, and I told my dad, like, I know this is my second high school, but I got to leave. Yeah. And my dad didn't want me to go to school in Oakland, but, you know, my older brother, he was like, you got to let him go to the OAL. Like, you got to yeah. let him. So my dad let me leave, and I transferred to Oakland High. 
So when I get to Oakland High, like, you would expect it to be a worse environment, which it was, like, mm. as far as what went on. Mm. But when I transferred to Oakland High, like, all my best friends went there. Drake, Drill, PJ, TJ, like. Squad. I, squad. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was, like, I had been knowing them. I grew up around them. Like, and when I transferred there, I was like, I'm about to be starting. I'm hooping again. Like, I'm with my friends. And I remember, like, I came to school. After school, it was like we had study hall and then practice, and then, you know, we would go from there. And I just remember, like, I went to study hall thinking, like, we finna mess around. You know what I'm saying? Like, we just finna chill till it's over and leave. And when we went to study hall, all my friends is like, they just got on point. Like, they all had 4.0s. Like, all of my friends had 4.0s. And I never knew that they was like that academically. Yeah. So, you know, it was that. And then we would go to practice, and they was just way more on point than I was as far as, like, discipline and just doing the right stuff all the time. And I think that was where everything changed for me because they was looking at me sideways like, damn, you always, like, oh, yeah. do your homework. <laughs> like, why you, why you late? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'd be late to practice, and then – Summer league game, I don't start. I come there, we got practice. I wouldn't bring shoes to school. Like, I would just, like, not <laughs> Bro, have hoop shoes. I don't even know this person. <laughs> yeah. Like, I have no clue who this person But is. it was, like, that's when it really changed for me because, like, my friends was, like, on point. And yeah. I think once it was, like, kind of embarrassing for me because, like, they was looking at me like, what are you doing? Like, this ain't how we operate. So when that happened, that was when my discipline – I became like the disciplinarian. Yeah, like yeah. that's when I kind of was able to hold myself accountable, and that's why you be like, man, you like your son gonna have a hard time because <laughs> you don't you don't cut no slack. And that yeah. was kind of the beginning of that where yeah, it was a, like, man, you know, that was a turning point for me. Yeah. No, that's real. And like fast forward to uh, you know you get to your NBA career. I always want to highlight something that was dope. R.I.P. Mamba, but your first game you played versus the Lakers. Yeah, and uh, I remember. I remember watching the game. I remember afterwards, Kobe was like, man, that Damian Lillard, that, he's nice. He's unbelievable. Go to that moment and talk about not only how big it was to, for, to be your first game, but to go up against Mamba and to get that type of respect, bro. That's Kobe. You know what I mean? No, I, I ain't going to lie. I think, and you know this, like once you come into the league, obviously you have the people that you, you look up to and you recognize them as like major stars. Yeah. But I was also in the game like – I don't know. I was almost just, like, ignorant to what was happening. Yeah. Like, I felt like I'm supposed to serve these dudes, you know? Yeah. Like, I felt like that was how it was supposed to happen. But, um, like, looking back on it, it was, it was crazy, you know, that I was kind of, like, ignorant to what was actually happening. It was, like, Kobe, Steve Nash, Dwight Howard, pal. <laughs> it was, like, a lot of Antoine Jameson. And you coming down hitting It was a lot of dudes shot. out yeah. there. But I just, you know, I didn't recognize the moment um, for what I should have recognized yeah. it for, at least. Like, it should have been some – like, my butterflies was more like, it's my first NBA game. Like, yeah. if I don't serve, like, my brother and them going to be talking <laughs> about me. Like, I wasn't thinking about, like – you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I wasn't thinking about it for what it was. Yeah. But, I mean, it was, it was a crazy experience. Even after the game, I still didn't realize. Because after the game, I, like – the night before, I was, like, writing raps – <laughs> and after the game, I walked up to, to Nate, and I was like, bro, like, I can really rap. Like, I can rap for real. And Nate was like, bro, <laughs> you just had 20 and 10 against the Lakers. And I was like, I know, but, like, I can really rap. You know what I'm saying? Like, I was ignorant to <laughs> – I can really rap. I was really blind to the fact, you know, yeah. because I wasn't I was impressed about it like that. That's real. So, that, I mean, that first night set the tone for, what's this, year 11? Year 11. Year 11. And in between there, you've had – Countless 60-point games, 50-point games, 40-point games. Mm. We don't even talk about the 30s or 20s. <laughs> you actually just got a triple-double, right? Yeah, that was I my showed you how to one, do that. Yeah, I you showed you how to do that. And then uh, when it comes down to it, you get into these modes where it's Dame time, it's Lillard time, but, like, literally the whole world stops. I cannot be watching a game legit. People are like, yo, you see your boy? You see your boy? Like, explain yeah. what that's like. I mean, it probably comes off nothing to you, but to get 60 points, four or five different – I texted you the other day, and like, bro, how are you averaging 40 in the best league in the world? Yeah. Like, it's the OAL. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I think when those moments are happening, I recognize that they're happening. Okay. You know, like, I, 
sometimes I have a big game. Like I've had 50 points before, and I'm like, I know I was killing, but it didn't feel like I had 50 one time against Golden State. It felt loud, you know. Yeah. Like, so I can feel when those moments are happening, and I'm just like, this is one of those nights, you know. Like this is. You can just feel when it's one of those just loud nights and people are going to be talking about it versus, like, I just got hot tonight, you yeah. know? Like, I, I can recognize those moments. I mean, it seems like it's almost targeted now. <laughs> Not really. No. I just – I think right now I'm just um, – I've been injured for four years. Like, yeah. I was having a, a real injury for four years that I didn't know how serious it was. So, just getting healthy. And then also, I only played 30 games last year, so – I had from January all the way to September of just not just getting right physically, but mentally spending more time with my kids and my family and just being away from the game. It, it let me just recharge. So now the focus that I'm able to come into games with and, you know, the health and how clear I'm able to come into games and just see what's going on and, you know, manipulate games and know what's going to work for me. It's just different, you know. I'm able to, to control the level that I play at much better to where it's like I'm going to either miss shots or make shots tonight. Mm, so, right. Talk about uh, you, you speak on a journey from coming in from rookie year to now being, you know, your 11th year in the league. You went from getting mentored to eventually taking over a team. I think my first year in, in Portland was like, yeah. I guess your first real year having a team because yeah. LaMarcus left. How how much different was that for you? Because you always spoke on it being LaMarcus's team, even though everybody thought it was your team. Yeah. How different was it for you to step up, be a leader, but at the same time not only worry about playing at a high level, but I'd be at halftime, Anthony Simons would be at your locker. You got to mentor him. Yeah. Yusuf Nurkic, first week on the team, he's kind of he's doing his thing, kind of struggling in certain areas. And I'm looking at the back of the plane and Dane with a, with a laptop pointing at it like it's his little bro. I'm like, man, he must have misspelled something wrong. Like, you know nah. what I mean? <laughs> so at this level, like, you spoke on obligations, but yeah. what's the toughest part about literally not only leading a whole franchise, but leading a whole city? I think it's um, – for me personally, I think I take on a lot of burdens that aren't asked of me yeah. because that's just – I want to see people do well. I want to see people be happy. Um, and I th it, was a, it was an adjustment from – when LA and everybody left to when I jumped out front because I always knew what needed to be said and I always could feel what was off, you know, and stuff like that. But I would have to speak on it sometimes, you know, yeah. I didn't have to be the voice. Yeah. And I was comfortable with that. I was like, yeah, I recognize what's happening right here in the timeout. I know what to say. Um, but everybody wasn't looking to me to say it. So it was a lot less pressure on you know being mm -hmm. a leader or knowing you know picking those moments and then when all of the older guys was left and now we got inexperienced players and then we got guys who this is their first year here you mo chief mace like so now like i remember the first practice we had we came in the huddle and i was like am i supposed to break the huddle you know what i'm saying <laughs> like so i break the huddle you know and then i just slowly started to to speak up more but um it can be heavy just knowing, like, if we win, I'm going to get a lot of credit. If we lose, it's my fault, you know, even though it's a, it's 15 dudes participating. Mm. You're going to get a lot of credit for success. You're going to get blamed for failures. Um, you know, your teammates are going to look to you for approval and for support, and you can't be above that, you know, even though sometimes that can be draining too when you got to support people and you got to – you know, carry a team. You got to perform. <laughs> yeah, you got to be yeah. an ear so people can express themselves and say what they need to say to you. Um, you know, you got to be with the group. You know, you got to be in touch with the group. Okay. And that takes that takes care. You know, you got to care about it. You can't pretend to care about somebody because NBA players are smart. You know, they're going to mm -hmm. know, like, man, he's just he playing the game. So for me, I want my teammates to know, like, I care. Like, I'm, a, I'm willing to give it time. I have a we either going to text, like you said, I'll come sit next to him on a plane and I'll, or I contact somebody in the video room, like, hey, send me um, Ant's minutes versus, you know, the Blitz. Send me 50 possessions versus Blitz. Or send me Nurk's 50 post ups. Send me Shaden in transition. Like, I'll look for opportunities to extend myself in support and then I'll back it up when the next opportunity comes, even if it, 
even if it costs us as a team, yeah. just to show them, like, I'm on your team. And if it goes bad, I'm going to be with you when it goes bad. Yeah. And I think that's what it takes to – to go through and how to truly lift up a player and to get a team to really like rally behind you uh -huh. and to get more out of a team than what people might think you can, you know, yeah, I take those did. steps, you know, uh -huh. consistently. Um, so I think that's what it is. And like you said, that can be, that can be heavy. Like sometimes you are more fatigued and tired, not just because of the physical output, but like the, the effort and the care that you put into everything else. Yeah. And for certain nights I'll hit you like, uh, the other night, I think I might hit you at 3 a.m. I was like, bro, go to sleep. Do not worry about that game. Like, go to the And next I text you right back because you knew I was up. Like, <laughs> like, bro. Yeah. I mean, it's one thing that I've gotten a little bit better at is just letting them go, you know. Like, I would, we would lose games and I would get in my car. And I would, the first thing I would do, I'm going to call Gus. And then I'm going to text CJ. And then I'm going to call Oz. Mm. And I'm going to be just calling everybody just so we can talk about it instead of just being like, man, let me just kind of wind down, go eat, go home, like get to the next day. Um, and now, you know, having kids and being yeah. married, you it's easier to kind of just not let it go, but you just kind of like more calm about it. You accept it a little easier. Um, what's, the big, what's the biggest sacrifice? Like, is it the music? When you're talking about marriage and everything, when's the next album dropping? You know what I mean? My next album <laughs> dropping when the season ends. Yeah. Don Dollar. So make sure y'all uh, tap in with that. It's going to be on all streaming services. Um, but I think the, the biggest sacrifice is uh, the time to myself. Yeah. You know, I would always, like, before I had kids, before I was married, I was, like, I was going to find some time for yeah. myself, you know. Um, and now – just having that so much time away from the game and then like being with my kids and like being able to see them change over a year, like actually witnessing the change and the growth in, in their development and actually being at home with my wife and then being at home and seeing my family all the time and going on trips and stuff like that. Like now that I got to experience that, like in the middle of my career now, I value those things more than I did. And I valued them before, but now that I got to just live it every day, now it's like, man, like I'm if I got if I can go play Madden or go go to dinner with somebody or and I can just be with my kids, like I'm gonna be with my kids nine and a half times out of ten. You know? Mm -hmm. So like it's just it changes in that way. You know what I'm saying? Like you willing to give your the time that you have for yourself, you willing to to sacrifice that for for other things. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, the legacy part. I think a lot of people talk current. I think, uh, you know, sometimes you never really fully hear from, you know, lack of a better phrase, a horse's mouth. Yeah. Well, how do you want to be remembered or where they want want to take it? And we spoke on a few different occasions about it, but, you know, you have five or six years left of playing. Yeah. Like, you already been known for the dominance of, uh, you know, scoring. You already overcame and taken, you know, lesser teams to playoffs. Yeah. And, you know, took the Portland Trailblazers to their first Western Conference Finals in 20-plus years. Overall, like, what do you want your legacy to be? And, like, not so much like I'm a great player, but, mm -hmm. like, legit, like, they can't miss this part. They can't miss that. Like, don't write that on my tombstone. Um, I would say I want to be remembered for who I was, not as a player, but, like, the the principle that I stood on, regardless of how successful I was, how major the failure was, the criticism, what people thought I should have did, what people think of me and who they don't think I'm better. Like, no matter what was happening, I wanted to be remembered for who I was. Like, I stood tall, you know. I've stood tall in every situation. Um, and I want to be remembered for that, you know. No matter how much money I've made, how much success I've had, I've been able to sustain the same thing from the jump, you know. I haven't, I haven't changed from that. And uh, you don't see that often. You know, I've been around long enough to know that you don't see that often. People will be one way their first four years, mm -hmm. and then they have a different experience or something happens where this perspective changes, and now they think this. And then a couple years later, they think something different. And yeah. they view, like, I feel like I've stood on the same principles from jump. And a lot of people will be like, man, it's time to run from the grind. Or, <laughs> you know, it's time to, you know – you don't want to win. You just want to make, like, 
it's stuff like that that I just you know when I hear those things I'm like man people really don't get it you know what I'm yeah, saying bro, like yeah. I tell people I'm like bro dude really believes he can win in any situation and like when you add it up you bring one player put him yeah. in a different situation you might have multiple championships no I really believe that yeah. but like my thing is I play the game to win the championship just like everybody else you know what I'm saying like well, I'm not even going to say like everybody else because yeah. everybody don't play for that. But yeah, not even organizations. I, when you know in your heart that you truly train hard and take care of yourself and do everything to win the championship, I don't have to prove it to nobody. Like, I don't have to prove it to people that have never done what, what we've done or what I've done. So, like, I play to win the championship. It's just that I'm never going to let, you know, outsiders, people that don't, play at this level, people that talk about the game, people that just, you know, are media or whatever to the game, I'm never going to let them make me feel like um, a ring is what's going to make me certified, you know? Like, I know I play to win the championship, but I don't got to go play for the team that y'all tell me to play for to mm -hmm. do it, you know? If it comes to that and the team was like, man, we just going to rebuild or whatever. Like, I'm not going to be like, no, please keep me, no, you know? You, yeah, you just go somewhere else and be larger than life. If you, if you I mean, I'm, a just, I'm, a, I'm just going – I'm just standing on what I stand on. Yeah. But, like, the thing that gets confused is people like, man, he don't want to win. And mm -hmm. you would never do this, you will never do that. And to me, I'm like, I, I represent something on the inside and the people – the type of people that I come from that is way bigger than the ring. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and people, some people would never understand that. You know what I'm saying? Like, th it's these types of principles that I stand on is not does not mean I don't want to win a ring. Like, that's what I do it for. But I just don't play by the same rules or or think the same way that a lot of these people think. And I'm not talking about players. I mean, fans a lot of times, media or whatever. Like, when I'm done playing. I'm going to walk away and be proud of everything that I did. And I'm going to conduct myself and go about it in the way that I know I will be. And the day that I do walk away, these people are not going to talk about me anyway. You know, When they talk about who got the most 60-point games, they're going to be like, who is that dude? Dame has this many, <laughs> yeah. that many. Or the Trailblazers, this, they haven't done this since mm -hmm. Dame. But it's going to be that type of conversation. Like, mm -hmm. y'all not about to be talking about me or caring about my well-being or none of that. Yeah. So that makes it – that's even more of a reason for me to stand on what I stand on and to, to march that way. And I'm going to continue to march that way. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's what it is for me. I, I saw an article the other day. You ranked yourself as the second best shooter of all time, which is – I was talking to Dre the other day. I'm like, bro, I'm not going to lie. Put them next to each other. I can't really see him missing. And I can't see 30 missing either. So it's just a, a draw. But I, give, I, give, I give it to Steph. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like – the percentage, like, I feel like Steph is the only player that shoots the type of threes that I shoot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and the way that they the way that they play, that he gets a lot more catch and shoots. But, like, I think Steph is the greatest shooter of all time. Like, by the numbers, yeah. by how many he's made, by the way his jumper looks, mm -hmm. 90, the quality 50, 40, of the shots yeah, that yeah. he makes, like, I don't think it's up for debate. But I do think that he's the only player that shoots the type of threes that I shoot. Like, I've never been a player that gets – quality three-point opportunities it's always off the dribble it's always contested it's deep off the dribble you know is they tough threes you know yeah. so to make the amount that I've made and to make it at the clip that I make it at for how tough they are um I do think I am like I think is 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 people like Clay you know Ray Allen the Mark Prices you know it's like uh -huh. the dudes that really got jumper that's like <laughs> I feel like James Harden because he his is off the dribble, you yeah. know. But I mean, like when you talk about coming into it left right, coming into it right left, coming into it off the hop, fading to the left, fading to the right, off the dribble, catch and shoot. Like when you consider all of those things, like I'm in the conversation for number two. That's right. I'm in the conversation for number two, and like. So, so then, what are you in a conversation at for uh, the Pantheon and point guards? For. Point just guards? currently and then just like over time i mean i don't know like currently i think i'm top i'm top two you know and i'm gonna always feel that way when i step on the court i'm always think i'm the best point guard out there um but i think when it comes to the history of the game man the game is so different now yeah. you know it's hard to 
I've been, I've, I forget who it was. I saw somebody say, you know, it's hard to compare eras. Now, some people is just they going to cross over. Magic Johnson, yeah. you know, like I think it's that type of conversation. But, like, one thing that I've noticed is that, like, people are never going to give me credit for, you know, my real body of work, you know. Like, that's just – I know that for a fact based off of like what I see, you mm-hmm. know, without having to go search after what do people think. It's like the consensus is like, Dame ain't better than this person. Dame don't got no ring. Dame, you know, yeah, like you I never miss the playoffs. Oh, you know what I mean? Like, I do I do think there's a lot of people that support me and a lot yeah. of people that respect my game and respect what I've done. But when you look at like when you take a look at like everything and how people naturally just look at stuff and what they say. They they never they'll never give me credit for what I've actually done, unless I just come out here and win the championship in Portland, yeah. and they better hope that don't happen. <laughs> well, like they better said, pray that I don't win the championship for the Blazers. And it ended off with uh, I get that's and that's very true. And they better off, pray because the same way you like they don't know that side. They going <laughs> they better pray I don't win the damn championship. And hey, if you do. I want to be on a float with you. <laughs> I'm just joking, but once again, bro, you will be, bro. Thanks for um, thanks for coming through for real, bro. Yeah, for this sure. is our big time. Thanks for giving us your time. I had tons of fun, and um, clearly it's All Star Week, and we thought we were gonna do this via Zoom. And you, my boy, for being like, no, I'm pulling up. Yeah, I really I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, yeah, so sure. thank you once again, and uh, that's a wrap, Jay. Yeah, for sure. Appreciate you, bro. Well, uh, bro. Well, they better pray on win no championship.